listen to their screams. Greetings, ghouls and creeps, and welcome to Listen to Their Screams, a horror podcast. I am one of your hosts, Dave. I'm joined, as always, by the other host, Ike. Ike, how are you? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. I think I'm doing a little bit better than you are today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd be okay if I could just breathe, but no. Hey, I feel like I have crawled back from the uh, the the, uh, the edge of death. So, I, I mean, this is an improvement over where I've been in the last week. But, yeah, I am. Uh, I still got a lot of head congestion and everything else. So if I uh, sound like I'm in a box, that's just, you know, that that's just that. But, uh, it is but we're simply gonna, the mortal coil that I am attached to at this moment. It is. But uh, we're going to power through because we got movies to talk about. And we uh, thank everybody for joining us. Make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Letterboxd. Just look up Listen to Screams. That is Listen, the number two, and Screams. Uh, special thanks, I guess. To our wives, Kayla and Monica, after coming on last week and, uh, well, doing whatever it is they're doing, uh, doing uh, the, the very first Wise Rebuttal last week where they told us how we were wrong in our assessment of Skinnamarink. I'm not sure how one can be wrong with their opinions, but, you know, whatever. Uh, but uh, look forward to future installments of that, I guess. <laughs> can't, can't get enough of that. But, uh, yeah, they will be back in the future. To, uh, to tell us we're wrong some more. Uh, as always, this is a movie review podcast. We discuss horror movies here. So you are being issued your first spoiler warning. Uh, we may ruin plot points, and uh, you've been warned. So, Ike, what have you been up to this week? Have you watched anything, done anything fun? Oh, man. Well, I've, I honestly I haven't done a whole, whole lot. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think of anything that I've done that would be considered horror-related. Uh, it's not horror related, but I, I uh, had Hawaiian food for the first time last weekend. Um, wow. It was it was really good. It's really good. There's a place here in uh, Florida. I can't remember where it is. Crestview, I think. I think it's called. Uh, oh God. Anyways, it was really good. Uh, Hawaiian food. Never never had that before. So that was kind of an experience. It, it was obviously delicious. I, I like all food. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. But uh, they had, like, Kahlua pork and all this other stuff. But, uh, yeah, not horror-related, but I wanted to share that. I was very, very happy with my Hawaiian food experience. Oh, <laughs> and I got to try a Spam Masubi, which is, like, um, the teriyaki Spam on rice wrapped in seaweed. Yeah, I will. Uh, i try anything with Spam. I'm, I'm a big <laughs> big fan of Spam. Uh, very much enjoy enjoy Spam. I guess if you ask the right person, they might tell you spam is pretty scary, which, I mean, to be fair, it, it is mystery meat, so I guess it is a little spooky. Yeah. But, man, it's so good, though. Yeah, I find it best just not to overthink it. It's just, you know, it, it, it tastes all right, it tastes good, so I just go with that. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, my whole week has been spooky, as I just feel like I've just te- teetered on Crawled the brink of, the <laughs> of death and fighting for every breath I can take, and... <laughs> Everything else. I mean, this has been a rough week, and uh, but otherwise, I've been pretty good. I've uh, rewatched a couple Friday the Thirteenth movies because that's you know when I'm sick and I need a comfort movie. Of course, I turned that on. But uh, right. <laughs> I think I watched. What did I watch? I think I watched four through six because I, I think that's where I stopped in my previous rewatches at three. So I just started with four. And I think I watched like three of them, and uh, I don't think I watched anything really new though because I was in and out of sleep, so I didn't really want to turn anything new on. That I wouldn't. You were drifting in and out of consciousness, so you're like just yeah, putting something on the background. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, I did watch our movies for this week, which of we are course. reviewing: The House That Jack Built from 2018 and Infinity Pool from 2023. Uh, we know we said we were going to review uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, but unfortunately, we were wrong, and the movie was not offered in either of our areas. Uh, we we thought it was, but somehow we had a misleading information. So uh, we will we will watch Winnie the Pooh when it comes out on streaming, and or on video on demand, and we'll 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 talk about it at that point. Gotta say I was a little disappointed I couldn't watch the killer Winnie the Pooh movie, but that's okay. Uh, see see it was weird and like and honestly it it wasn't as you know I'm not super heartbroken about not being able to see it in theaters. 
Um, you know, I was a little more heartbroken about the potential of not seeing like Terrifier 2 in theaters. But honestly, yeah. the, whole, the whole thing kind of gave me Terrifier 2 vibes. Because, um, you know, like Dave said, like, we really didn't have it. I, we had one showtime on the day that we recorded our last episode. Um, and, like, you know, I was we were obviously busy, so I wasn't able to go see that. And I was thinking to myself, oh, they'll put more showtimes up. Boy, was I fucking wrong. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, but I was so surprised, you know what I mean? So, you know, it's just yeah. like, can't, can't squeeze one other showtime in there over the weekend. <laughs> yeah, that's weird that just one showtime for something like that. Uh, but uh, but we have done our we have done our research for next week because next week we are reviewing <laughs> Cocaine Bear, and uh, we have both checked and and yes the movie is showing in both our areas, <laughs> uh, so you know we should be good to go. I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty stoked to watch Cocaine Bear. Uh, sounds like a fun movie, but that's next week, so let's don't get ahead of ourselves. No, right, don't get too far. So, ahead uh, <laughs> no, no. So before that, uh, and before we get too far into this, let's go ahead and jump in and let's play top three. Top three. <laughs> All right, on this episode, uh, given given our choice of movies today, we have decided that we are going to talk about our top three most disturbing movies that we enjoy. And um, we, we made sure we, we plugged in that we enjoy because there are some disturbing movies out there that purely just have shock value that, uh, that you know, I'm not really into. Yeah. And uh, – and this one was kind of – this was very difficult for me because I'm not a just-watch-a-disturbing-movie kind of guy, uh, you know. So – and, uh, and you're, you know, the movies that I watch don't necessarily really bother me per se. So it's hard for me to find something that disturbed me, that I would co- say disturbed me. So essentially the three movies that I chose in my top three were more of a uh, kind of – there was nothing content-wise per se that made me cringe – or anything like that. It was more the a, a visual concept of it, more or less. There was something about it visually that that you know what I mean. It's not something that had yeah. a had an edgy topic or an edgy scene or a controversial scene or anything like that per se. Uh, because I just don't I don't really get into movies like that too much. You know if they I don't I don't I don't I don't know I don't just don't really go for a movie that just puts shock in for shock value. You know if it ties into the the gist of the movie, okay, so be it. Uh, and again, then you, you know, I mean, you know, what do you consider disturbing? Because there are some graphic, gory movies out there that some people would say is very disturbing that, that don't bother me at all. I mean, right. we just discussed Outwaters last week, and my favorite part of the movie was the guy cutting his penis off and walking around with his <laughs> his uh, intestines dragging behind him. So, but some people, you know, thought that was disturbing, and I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know, to me, that's not classified as disturbing. So, so this one was was a challenge for me, but. And I'm not sure that you know everybody would agree that these movies are necessarily quote unquote disturbing, but uh, they are for me at least at the the point of at least the the point of first watching them, right? Were what I would call disturbing. So, all right. So are we ready to begin? I, I, I would guarantee so. you. I don't. I, I guarantee you. I mean, we have zero overlap today. Oh uh, yeah, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I, if we did, I'd be very 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 surprised. So, so I will go ahead and start. My number three most disturbing movie that I enjoyed was from 2009, Splice. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, again, the movie, I mean, disturbing is an odd word for it because it's, it's not like the concept of the movie disturbed me. But there was a, aspects of it that I was kind of like, whoa, that kind of – and particularly uh, the uh, – I don't know what you want to call it. The, I guess the lovemaking scene or whatever or the <laughs> – you know, between the the whatever the genetic engineer or scientist or whatever he was, and uh, and the experiment, so to speak, or whatever you want to call it, the creation, um, you know that that was a little bit uh, what I would what I'm classifying as disturbing here, and uh, so yeah, so uh, and, and again the creature was it was kind of freaky, kind of creepy, and uh, you know and, and and I think it's the fact of this movie that it that doesn't feel that far fetched to me. That something yeah. like this could could happen in this day and age. You know, that I don't feel like we're that far from something like that, and that that's a little disturbing to me. That you know, that where you uh, get to the point where your scientific experiments, you know, maybe cross the line into becoming a, a threat or something uh, uncontrollable, or or you know, not knowing what's going, the results are going to be, not having full control of it. That that to me is a little disturbing. So, so like, what do you what do you think of, of Splice? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I love Splice. Um, I saw it in theaters when it came out. Um, like you said, the movie in of itself isn't terribly uh, controversial or anything, but it, it does kind of, you know, it kind of crosses a few a few boundaries and it asks some very important questions about creation. And honestly, one of the things that I really liked about this movie, and it honestly, to me, it, it kind of ties back into like that, that kind of Frankenstein story. You know what I mean? Um, obviously, you know, the creature in Splice was not an amalgamation of body parts, but it, but it was a scientific creation from what one could call a mad scientist. And, you know, like you said, it kind of talks about, you know, at, at what point does that creation, that, that genetic engineering, at what point does it pose a threat? Um, so Splice is actually really cool. Um, really great movie, science fiction at its best, horror at its best, because it doesn't have to be um, blatantly shocking for it to be scary in this case. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And again, the one the one scene just <laughs> made me <laughs> burned into your eyelids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Ike, what is your number three most disturbing movie that you enjoy? Absolutely. So um, I'm going to definitely say that I went a pretty largely different direction than you did. Um, oh, I think you would. So I, I definitely agree that what's considered shocking to me probably may not be shocking to somebody else, but there are certain films that I watch and I'm like, well, shit, like that was kind of fucked up. Um, but at the same time, you know, it was a movie that I could still enjoy. And I have unfortunately watched movies that are really messed up that I did not enjoy, you know, yes. movies that were recommended to me. I'm not going to name who recommended them to me, but um, I spit on your grave is one of those movies that I will never ever watch again but there are movies that are shocking but they're not shocking in a way that makes you like disgusted they're shocking and like a whoa, whoa you know so my number three is the the green inferno uh by eli roth uh from 2013 so the green inferno follows a doc uh, it's not even a documentary crew i almost said documentary crew because it honestly this movie reminds me a lot of uh, cannibal holocaust but Green Inferno follows a uh, group of people on a plane. The plane crashes over the jungles. Uh, I can't remember what continent, but basically they get found by a tribe of cannibals and they are tortured and eaten by the cannibals. Um, and they're tortured in various ritualistic methods by these uh, this tribe. And it, it's incredibly disturbing. It's a very, very scary concept and it's a very very scary film um it's very visceral a lot of um you know a lot of gore and just everything else and and, and it was very disturbing i watched it in theaters i actually worked at the movie theater at this time when we got, eventually got it and yeah i gotta say i was very uh very surprised by that movie i was very surprised that it uh, didn't get an nc-17 rating um so much so so uh, it was a good movie. I enjoyed it, but that's my number three uh, disturbing movie, if you will. Yeah, uh, ca- cannibalism is a big one, right? That's a it's yeah. a it's a big topic theme, whatever you want to call it, uh, that uh, that really rattles people, right? I mean, it, I mean, obviously, it's you know culturally, it's it's not an acceptable thing in the majority of the world, and uh, I mean, there, there's obvious reasons I get that, but it's uh, so the concept that in parts of the world th- it is. <laughs> you know, that, and that occurs and that happens right. or or incidents where it has had to occur. Um, it, it is jarring and it, it's jarring to think. And it's a, and it is disturbing to think in those scenarios, you know, uh, and I'm sp- not speaking to this one, you know, this movie in particular, but like, you know, the majority of your survival type movies where this, this concept comes up, what, uh, what a person, what you, what would you do in that scenario? Right. Could you yeah. do that? You know, what was, you know, it, again, it's, it's a very controversial topic. Um, and, and it, you know, very kind of jarring topic for people to think about and discuss. Uh, definitely, definitely, I would say a, a disturbing topic. Um, and uh, and again, you know, when it comes up in a lot of movies, right, that you would call, you know, you spoke of Cannibal Holocaust. I mean, that's, you know, it's a often, you know, that's often credited as being an extraordinarily disturbing movie and uh, and everything. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 a common kind of a common theme in these. So but my number two most disturbing movie that I enjoy is a movie that's I don't know that anybody would probably throw this movie out there. Um, I don't know 
I, I don't know. I don't know what the, the consensus is, the opinions are of this movie. Uh, this movie really, really kind of wigged me out. And it, and again, it was because of – well, there was multiple aspects, but it was more than anything. It's just the visuals in this movie. Uh, and it is from 2014. It is Tusk. Oh, yeah. It is – this movie, I, I don't know – I don't know why, but it was so – the concept of whatever you want to call it, converting man to walrus or whatever, you know, however you wanted to say it, it was, was really, really weird to me and very odd. And not only the, the physical aspect but the mental aspect of it and, and, and all that was associated with it, uh, but – and, uh, and you know, and I went to New Jersey and uh, to, to Kevin Smith's comic shop, and he had this uh, – I don't know what it was, was used for. <laughs> but a model or whatever you want to say of, of Justin Long as the walrus. And it was, you know, virtually, I mean, it was pretty much essentially life size. It was very large. And uh, I mean, and it creeped me out to see him that it was just, there was something very, uh, I don't know, very, very ick about it. That just really disturbed me. And, and again, I don't know whether a lot of people would really classify this as a disturbing movie or even that scary a movie or anything else. Uh, but it certainly disturbed me. I, what do you think of Tusk? No, absolutely. Um, well, first and foremost, I love Tusk. I love Kevin Smith, and I think that Kevin Smith has a lot of really underrated movies. Um, you know, obviously, everybody knows him for Clerks. Everybody knows him for Mall Rats. Everybody knows him for those, you know, those movies. But a lot of people don't realize that he's also ventured into these sort of like other other areas. And honestly, one of the big ones in this case would be Tusk. Tusk is it's hard because it is disturbing and, and also it kind of again ties back into the concept of Frankenstein. I mean, this is just Frankenstein's monster in a, in a different light. Um, at least in my, in my opinion, but the concept of turning a human into an animal and like the visuals of like the patchwork of his skin that that's seared into my mind too, because at the end when you see him like as a walrus and he's like all stitched together, you're thinking to yourself, like, what amount of pain and suffering did this person have to go through to reach this final like, you know, I guess evolution of being a walrus? And it's supposed to be a horror comedy. I mean, you have Johnny Depp who plays like what is it, Guy, Guy LaPointe or something like that, yeah. who's like some goofy detective or something. And, yeah. and and it's like it's supposed to be like a comedy, but then it's like also kind of like low key, really fucked up. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. Maybe absolutely. maybe maybe I just have problems with that that scientific concept of you know just because you can, maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> maybe that's, yeah. Maybe I just find that disturbing. And uh, you know, and I mean, don't don't get me wrong, I'm a huge supporter of science and and the advancement and the, and the, the positives it can do. But you know, like with anything in life, you know, you, you have to think about that. What when you have that knowledge of power in the wrong hands, what, you know, what happens? And, uh, I don't know. So maybe, maybe there's a theme here to what I find disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. So, yeah. So like, what is your number two most disturbing movie that you enjoy? Absolutely. Um, so again, definitely a, a vastly different, uh, approach, but I, I would say my number two is Hostel from 2005. Um, yeah. Hostel, Hostel is one of those kind of, so obviously it's very visceral. It's got a lot of gore, a lot of violence. I mean, I think the one of the scenes that's really stuck out to me, because here's the thing, I, I had never seen Hostel until about a year ago. Um, it was actually right before I moved to Florida. Uh, my wife was visiting uh, one of her cousins right before we moved, and I was home alone. So I'm just watching horror movies, playing video games, and I decide, well, let me give Hostel a try. I've never seen it. Everybody says it's like a really – scary movie it's a horror movie it's a violent movie it's like one of the eli roth's best movies what people usually say and so i watch him i'm like wow this this is extraordinarily fucked up i mean there's a scene where this uh woman gets her eye like burned out with a uh with a, like a soldering iron and like yeah that's really messed up and like it visually is horrifying but more so, in some ways, the concept of hostile. Hostile is literally a concept of human trafficking. You know what I mean? And human trafficking doesn't just happen to, you know, because obviously the, the primary target of human trafficking in real life is women and children. But 
a lesser known part of that is trafficking of men as well. And this movie really approaches that concept and it's horrifying. The concept of being human trafficked <clears throat> genuinely has given me nightmares. So this movie really plays on A, human trafficking, B, torture, which I hate the concept of that. Like, I don't like being in pain. So it's just a, it's a very violent movie with a very, very disturbing premise. And it's just, whew, definitely, yeah. uh, <laughs> definitely gives, sends chills down my spine. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Hostel would, I mean, Hostel would clearly, if you were, you know, whatever, if you pulled however many hundred people, that was, it's going to be on a lot of those lists as yeah. a disturbing movie. And, uh, but maybe, maybe we have a theme here too, as well, that maybe, you know, Maybe it's just you find Eli Roth. <laughs> His I, movie's very disturbing. <laughs> I, I didn't do that intentionally either. I realized I was making my list, and I'm like, oh, shit, both these movies are by Eli Roth. I will say my, my first movie, my most disturbing movie, is not an Eli Roth movie, I promise. Well, there you go. <laughs> so he could trigger you, but just not not the most triggering. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so let's move on to our number ones. My number one, again, I, I don't know how many uh, – people of my generation – I, I think would uh, would definitely maybe concur this was a disturbing movie, especially at the time. Uh, this movie came out when I was 11 years old. Uh, I went and watched it until a few years later uh, on home video. It went, I would, it's not something I would have w- went to a theater to see at 11. Um, and it, this movie visually just 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 fucking blew my mind and and creeped me out and grossed me out. It has some of the most oh, I don't even know how to phrase it. Some of the most disgusting visual effects to watch. Um, it, it, the, the transformations in it, and it is from 1986. Which, sorry, Jeff Goldblum. It is The Fly, and uh, oh, yeah. this movie fucking just the watching him change into this creature, and you know the teeth falling out, and, and this, and it was it was it's, it still is to me is just visually disturbing and disgusting, and um and and, and to think that this was this is all this is pre CGI, right? I mean this is we're talking, you know, practical type effects and everything else, and um, it, it blows my mind. Uh, of course, I love Jeff Goldblum, and uh, but this movie, as a as a young man, <laughs> as a teenager or early teen when I watched it, uh, just just creeped me out. And it is still one of those movies that when I see it and I see the especially those transformations, like I said, the transformation uh, just uh, just makes me cringe. Um, you know, of course, it's it's a remake of a, of, a, of an old movie from the '60s. Which was not nearly as visually <laughs> disturbing uh, from that time, but uh, so Ike, Ike, what do you think of, of the Fly from '86? So I'm going to be honest with you, I have never uh, seen oh. the Fly. I have, however, seen the scene that you're referencing, where like he kind of comes out yes. like a, the monster. I have seen that, yeah. but I've not seen the movie itself. And I will say this: there is something truly beautiful, and I mean that in a very non-like, you know controversial way but there's something very truly beautiful about the 80s and 90s where they really relied on practical effects yep i i am a very huge fan of practical effects i've talked about it before um movies like the thing who you know rely on practical effects for their monsters you know they they definitely have an extra scare factor because one of the biggest things that you see in modern uh media is CGI. You see the animation. And CGI and animation have gotten really great. But there's just there's just an unprecedented quality of practical effects that you cannot get with special effects, unfortunately. Absolutely. Yeah. Um Terrifier, for instance, Terrifier 2, they relied heavily, and Terrifier relied heavily on practical effects. And yeah. thank God for that. Honestly, in my opinion, Terrifier 2 and Terrifier 1, Damien Leone and a whole crew creating those movies with practical effects in my opinion is not only an homage to the practical effects that came before but it's hope that we'll continue to use those practical effects moving forward but yes i do need to watch the flights actually on one yes, of my lists <laughs> yes yeah practical it's to me it's the uh in a non-horror topic here lots of people the 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 uh the arguments about star wars right yeah and the the the, the of course i love the original trilogy right that is that was my those are my movies and everything else, but to me, what set those apart even more than the prequel trilogy that came later is, you know, you can talk story, you can talk whatever, blah 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 blah. But what set the original apart was the practical effects, the miniatures, the models, and the way they filmed those. 
because to me it gave it, it gave it depth and made it it, it gave it that uh, that tr- that camera trickery of realism. You know, you 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 don't know that they're filming miniatures, and it feels like they're truly filming these ships. And, uh, and when when done right, uh, practical effects, you know, in, in partnership with you know the film the film technique, uh, you can you can trick the eye to even even greater than CGI uh, that what you're seeing is is something real. And uh, you know, so and, and uh, yeah, but anyway, back to the topic here. The the, the fly, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I, can, I had to recommend it. it's great. And it, it always creeped me out, and it was disturbing. And like I said, the transformation scene scene was unreal. So, all right, Ike. So that brings us to your number one. What is your favorite, uh, most, or excuse me, what is your most disturbing movie that you enjoy? Absolutely. And and so this one, I'm gonna have to get a little deep, but the movie is called Raw. Um, so it's a it's a movie about a young woman who is studying to be a vet. It's a foreign language film. Um, but she goes to a school um, for veterinary practice, and basically she starts getting into like the college life. And there's like a hazing ritual, and the hazing ritual, um, she's forced to eat raw meat. Now she had grown up a, a staunch vegetarian, as in like cannot eat meat, will not eat meat. Was told that she was like she was allergic to eating meat, and so when she ate the meat, she realized that she wasn't allergic, and but she started developing these weird cravings. Well, turns out that she has very strong primal cravings for human flesh. And this movie is not only disturbing from the perspective of like the woman is a cannibal, like she needs human meat because if she doesn't like she goes into like these weird kind of like withdrawals, like a drug addict. So it kind of this movie approaches a lot of topics and 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 it's really it's very artfully done but it it treats this uh need for flesh almost like an addiction um and so it it really touches on the very sensitive topic of addiction and how addiction affects people and how addiction works but it also talks about innocence because this girl she was uh you know, a vegetarian before she went to college, she was hazed and she had to eat raw meat and now she's a cannibal. So it kind of talks about like this slow descent into madness, this descent into this is not who I want to be. And so the movie really dives into a really lot of uh, really disturbing concepts and a lot of disturbing concepts that we have to deal with in real life, addiction, um, you know, growing up, college, you know, hazing, things like that, that are very real, very prevalent and can affect people in very negative ways. So has a lot of that psychological fear, uh, but also it, visually speaking, it, it really crosses a lot of boundaries with, you know, this person is he has to eat raw, he has to eat human flesh or else like she goes into like withdrawal. And um, it, it's honestly a really good movie, foreign language film, um, has a really interesting twist at the end. So uh, super good, super disturbing, very disturbing, but very, very good. Yeah, yeah, I can't say I've seen her all, so. Uh, maybe maybe I'll have to give it a try. That that does sound intriguing. So definitely does sound disturbing. Um, you know, not not to be a little the uh, you know people's addictions or whatever else, but yeah, uh, you know, addiction is a it's a wild thing. You know, and it can uh, you you know you can be addicted to you know damn near anything. You know, I mean it, you know a lot of times you know because a lot of times they will trigger the same things in the mind, but uh, you know it can come from different ways. So sounds pretty wild. So, uh, yeah, let's take a break. Let me uh, get a drink, maybe catch my breath, put on some oxygen, uh, (laughs) see if we can get through the rest of this. Uh, But we'll be right back with some news and upcoming releases. Remember, in the course of discussing movies, the host will spoil plots. You've been warned. All right, and we are back, so we're going to go ahead and jump right into some news. Um, and keep in mind, that's the first time I'm reading this, and uh, I already read this first line, and I am already super fucking excited. Um, <laughs> so for toys and merch, we have Bloomhouse Productions is launching a gaming division called Bloomhouse Games. They will be developing and releasing indie games that are original horror-themed games for console, PC, and mobile audiences. No specific titles uh, have been announced, but we all know Bloomhouse has a incredible... Uh, I mean, a library of amazing IPs that they could very easily turn into video games. 
And I am very excited for this because, I mean, come on. You, you have Halloween, which is a Bloomhouse IP now. You have uh, the entirety of The Conjuring, which is an IP. I mean, there's so much cool stuff. The Purge. Oh, my God. What do you yeah. think, Dave? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, I don't know. The, just the possibilities are endless if they dive into some of them. I mean, just think of you know some kind of open world RPG type thing set in the Purge universe uh, on, you know, on Purge Night. And, 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 you know, you're, you know, it's, it's wild, you know, where you can literally, you could choose, you know, which, uh, which side do you want to fall on, right? Do you want to be where you try to survive it or do you want to be one of those, you know, <laughs> doing the purging? And right. uh, I mean, it's, it, uh, I mean, they, there's so many, so many possibilities of, of what they could do. And, uh, you know, and then, I mean, who knows, they can expand, you know, beyond their, beyond their own properties. I mean, this, you know, they could partner in with other, you know, other other things. They don't have to necessarily have, have put out the movie, you know, movie. You know, I mean, they could partner with any other other production company. Who knows what could happen? Uh, it's 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 remarkable. But uh, it's a cool concept to think that there will be, you know, a company out there to focus pretty much solely on these type games and yeah. these theme games. You know, I know there's there's other production companies and other software companies and development companies that, that do that. But I don't know, and again, I'm not hugely knowledgeable in this, but I don't know if there's one or, or anything that, that focuses just primarily on this, right? So it's, I think this would be a great you know, partnership with their, their movies and their and, and, and the IPs, like you said. And I don't know. I mean, the, the possibilities are endless on what they could do with this. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. Indie games is a very – I mean, it's a very interesting industry, and there's really not a – I would say a, a dedicated uh, entity that really does much with that. There are like things like, you know, independent, you know, crowdsourcing and stuff like that. Um, but there isn't like a, a major studio or major um, entity that focuses primarily on indie games and whatnot, but exciting stuff. But uh, we're going to move on to a, a few birthdays and other key dates and anniversaries. Uh, for February, we have February 23rd, we have Emily Blunt, uh, known for The Quiet Place 1 and 2. Uh, fantastic movies, of course. Uh, February 28th, we have Ali Carter from the Final Destination 1 and 2 and the Resident Evil movie franchise. Um, yep, I know exactly who that is. That's uh, Claire Redfield from the Resident Evil games. That, <laughs> and then uh, March 1st, so it's not quite February, um, but I know Dave had to include his husband, <laughs> Jensen Ackles. That's uh, right. Supernatural, My Bloody Valentine, and possibly the worst movie of all time, Devour. Um, happy birthday oh. to those people. <laughs> Love Jensen Ackles. Cannot stand Devour. I couldn't even get through it. Oh, it's so bad, so bad, so bad, so bad. Uh, I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> good luck. But uh do love Jensen Ackles. Of course, I love Supernatural. Uh, I like his take, you know, in My Bloody Valentine. Love him, you know, in uh, The Boys. Uh, you know, love him in his show, Big Sky. Ah. Just love me some Jensen Ackles, period. But, uh, <laughs> period. Absolutely. Love it. Um, so a really cool anniversary date, uh, I didn't know this, was February 19th is the 30-year anniversary of Army of Darkness, of course. Right. Um, uh, Sam Raimi and uh, Bruce Campbell's uh, horror comedy masterpiece, e e you know, Army of Darkness, fantastic. Uh-huh. Uh, and then in memoriam, um, this is actually pretty recent, uh, February 19th as well, uh, Richard Belzer from Law & Order SVU, um, Species 2 and the Puppet Master um, had passed. Um, I actually remember seeing that on uh, Facebook that popped up for me. Um, and, I, and I definitely recognize him from Law & Order, but when I started reading this, yeah. I realized he was also in the Puppet Master movies, which is, uh, which is yep. really good. My, my first memory of Richard Belzer is wrestling related, though, because he used to have a talk show in the 80s, and he's the guy... That had uh, in, in did he the, get uh, headlocked by Hulk Hogan yes, and dropped on by his Hulk head? Hogan. Yeah, <laughs> yep, yep. Okay, that's my first memory of Richard Bell's. Will probably always be. I don't care how many years he played uh, Munch on SVU, but uh, that'll always be my memory of Richard Belzer uh, was was getting you know put to sleep and dropped on his head uh, by Hulk Hogan on his TV show. You know, as soon as you started saying that, I'm like, wait a second, he looks like that guy. I wonder if he's the same guy. Yep, wow. That's him. All right. Oh, well, speaking of which, <laughs> he, 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 he filed a lawsuit, right? On a yeah. side note related, because this is a great story. Filed a lawsuit. They settled out of court for, I think it was like $800,000 or something. He he bought a home in the south of France, which is he still owned, which is where he was when he passed away, that he named Chateau Hogan. 
<laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh, it just cracks me up. I love that so that's great stuff. Sorry, go ahead. No, you're good. The whole the Hulkster bought me a house. Oh, um <laughs> brother. But a uh, couple of upcoming releases uh that you guys will probably want to know about. We have Cocaine Bear, of course, coming out on February 24th. Um, it is in theaters. This, of course, is a horror comedy. Um, this is a oddball of groups of cops, criminals, tourists, and teens converges in a Georgia forest where a 500-pound black bear goes on a murderous rampage after unintentionally ingesting cocaine. Uh, this is starring Ray Liotta, his final completed film prior to his death in 2022, which may or may not be unfortunate. I guess we'll see once we see this movie. Um, Carrie yeah. Russell. And this one actually surprised me. I remember I told my wife this because she loves um, this director. Uh, but this movie is directed by none other than Elizabeth Banks from the Pitch Perfect movies. Now, I'm not yeah. ashamed to say that I do like me the Pitch Perfect movies. So, um, you I, know, that legit <laughs> asked Monica, hey, you going to go see Cocaine Bear when I go see it? She's like, well, Elizabeth Banks involved. So, yeah, I might. I'm like, OK, <laughs> seriously, that's what got you – I mean, like, no offense, I love Elizabeth Banks, but, I mean, it's like, really, it's it's about a bear on cocaine based on a true story, and Elizabeth Banks is what sold you on this? So. That's what I was going to say. It's literally a bear hyped up on cocaine. Um, <laughs> but this is inspired in part by true events in 1985 when a corrupt Kentucky cop and lawyer turned drug smuggler, uh, Andrew Thornton, flew in a smuggling run, dumping packages of cocaine over Georgia before attempting to escape when nearly 80 pounds of it strapped to his body. However, the parachute malfunctioned and Thornton fell to his death in the Georgia residence driveway. 40 kilos of the thrown packages landed in national forest and were consumed by a black bear, black bear, sorry, who overdosed most likely within minutes, dying from cerebral hemorrhaging, Jeez. respiratory and heart failure after eating $20 million worth Adjusted for inflation, that's $55 million worth of cocaine. Holy shit. Only Thornton and the bear died. That's an, a very unfortunate story. Jesus Christ. So, so clearly they've taken some liberties here because it's a whole movie, not just that, you know, uh, the bear dies in a few minutes. But uh, it blows my mind. There, again, number one, what a horrible thing for, for the bear. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. bear didn't ask for this shit. This, this dumbass was doing, you know, smuggling this shit and, and caused this horrible, horrible thing. Uh, but this is one of those things that you read it and you're like, there's no way. Seriously, that really happened. And it's just, man, people are weird. If it's any consolation, I highly doubt the bear felt anything after consuming that much cocaine. Um, Probably not. So if, if anything, it was a peaceful release of some form after his heart exploded. Yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Anyways, on, on a more, I guess, positive note, um, knock, knock on the Cabin Door is now available for rent and purchase digitally on most platforms. Um, not that that's a positive movie at all, but. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but it's uh, but it is exciting. We just, uh, you know, spoke about it. I, I think you mentioned it just last episode, how you, 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 know, you yeah. can't wait to watch it again when it comes out streaming and bam, it's like they heard you. And uh, I'm telling like, you, that's one Emerald thing. Emerald bam. I, I, I yeah. I love, man, I love the quick turnaround now because things are filmed. You know, it's, it's, you know, there's no converting process anymore. You know, when it, you know, it's everything when it's filmed, it's digital, it's ready. So yep. it's like, I love, I love how quickly they can turn this around. And, uh, you know, how, I mean, you know, the movie's in theater, it has its run. And then next thing you know, it's like, oh, hey, it's, by the way, here it is. And it's, I love it. I, 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 I am a sucker for the convenience and, and the ease now. Uh, uh, it was wild to me that there used to be a, that there used to be the day of you'd see something in the theater and then have to wait months for the home video release. And uh, I was gonna say I wild. think that's that's one of the positive things that came from COVID was basically studios um, hastiness on getting these movies to a digital release. So um, I, I, I guess if we have anything to thank COVID for, I guess it, that would be one <laughs> one thing. <laughs> yeah. So I am I am looking forward to a second viewing uh, of Knock at the Cabin. Same, same. But all right, I think that pretty much does it for our news and events and uh, things of that nature. So uh, when we come back, we're going to go ahead and dive into our two movie reviews for this week. Listen to Their Screams is now a Fangoria collaborator. Get 20% off your order at shop.fangoria.com by using the promo code listen to screams at checkout. That is listen to number two and screams. Or you can click the link in the show notes. 
All right, and we are back. We are back and ready to rumble. Ready to rumble. That's a fantastic movie from the 90s if you've never seen it. Um, (laughs) Not the movie we're reviewing right (laughs) now. But um, we're going to start off with uh, a movie that actually I picked for this week. So this first movie is the movie The House That Jack Built from 2018. If you'd like to watch it, you can check it out on AMC Plus or Tubi. But uh, this movie is set in the 1970s. The story follows Jack, a highly intelligent serial killer, who over the course of 12 years um, depicts the murders that really develop his inner madman. This is starring Matt Dillon and Uma Thurman. It is written and directed by Lars von Trier, and the film had its world premiere at the Cannes, or is it is it Cannes, yeah? Just Cannes. I think it's just Cannes. Cannes. Okay. Yeah. At Cannes International Film Festival on May 14, 2018. It was reported that the movie that more than a hundred audience members, including some critics, walked out during the premiere through a six minute standing up. Pardon me, though a six minute standing ovation followed the screening, some of the audience members were upset and continued to condemn the film on social media for its extreme violence and nihilistic tone. Um, yeah. So <laughs> go ahead. Man. Let, let me dive right in here because here's my thing. This is, again, like I spoke earlier about what people conceive as disturbing, right? Because, yes, the movie, well, yeah, it's, it's disturbing, right? It's got disturbing visuals there's disturbing things about it and 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 i'm i know a couple of the scenes that well one in particular that i think probably really but i don't know i mean this was deep in the film so I, anyway but to me it's like in my mind i'm like i i think two things right number one it's a film number two i'm sorry you know there's nothing in this film that shit this does, that doesn't happen yeah right that has not happened and, and and whatever else it didn't depict it in any glorious light or any positive light that they weren't trying to, to to beautify it or anything now th- this guy this guy was wild right jack was it was crazy wild to me um because he was this he was a serial killer right and and like like serial killers and we spoke of addiction right he 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 became addicted to that feeling yeah. right and it, it, it was it was clearly filling a hole in his life, and and because there were there were parts that were you know he he became big on staging the bodies and taking pictures and and doing these things, and uh, there were parts where you know he talked about he wasn't happy with what you know this so he would retrieve bodies and back to the the the, the scene of the crime the scene of the murder so he could do it again and pose it again and blah 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 um, because he was clearly jonesing for that that feeling and that rush. And um, and I believe he talks about five incidents, which you know he says there's many, many more. You know, obviously, you know, whatever. But and uh, it's weird because, and again, we 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 we've spoken of spoilers. Um, you go through the whole movie thinking that Jack's spilling his guts while he's in prison, yep. or or on the premises premise, premises of of being executed or something like that. That's what that's the. That's the feeling you get. What's happening here? Because he's talking to someone who you get the vibe is a is a, you know an officer or a, a clergyman or I don't know something. You, a it's psychologist really unclear. or something. Yeah, psychologist or something. It's really unclear what it is, but you you go through the whole movie thinking that he's he's unloading all this right for whatever reason. Um, whether he's trying to justify, whether he's trying to explain, whether he's trying to relive, whatever it might be. And um, and it's, and the movie is, but you're no, you don't see him in the in the now while he's doing this. It's all in the going back to what he's talking about and seeing. And uh, you know, it, it it starts, whatever, rudimentary enough, right? He kills a, a girl, a lady that he picks up that has a flat tire, and blah blah blah. It moves on. Now, again, the one that to me I think probably would trigger a lot of people is the one with the wife and the two kids, where you know he shot the kids, and um. And, you know, I, I think that uh, that was disturbing. What, what do you think? I, do you, I think that was probably one of the most disturbing parts of the movie. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, I think that there are, two, like you said, there are two parts in the movie that I think could potentially have crossed, like maybe a line for some people. Um, and, and like you said, nothing that happens maybe hasn't happened in her life. And, and obviously, like you said, they're not even glorifying it because 
I mean, it, through the entire film, I mean, the guy that he's talking to, who he, who he refers to as Verge, uh, consistently and constantly, I mean, I, borderline is mocking the main character, Jack. I mean, he's telling him that these are like awful things. Like he's not, he's very clearly telling Jack that he's not a good person and yeah. he's going through all of this. And it, it like, it gets to the point where with the kids and then that one definitely like it stuck with me. Cause I remember that very, you know, pertinently, you know, where he's like, like, I mean, he's gunning them down, like in like a shooting range. And it's, it's yeah. horrible. Um, the the other one I think would be when the police eventually caught up to him at the end, and they go into his like what little warehouse where it's got like the fridge, um, and you finally see the the house that Jack built, and it's a um small shack inside of a industrial refrigerator made out of human bodies. Um, yeah. I could definitely see how somebody could take some uh some some offense to that, but yeah. but like you said um. This movie definitely it touches on a lot of things about being a serial killer. A lot of the, um, if you will, the 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 niche things that serial killers do. Serial killers are prone to OCD. Serial killers are prone to certain behaviors and mannerisms. And the way that they're approaching in this movie, you do think that they're approaching it from a very like scientific perspective of, you know, he has OCD. He has to have the perfect shot. If he doesn't have the perfect shot, he goes back and he changes the crime scene so he can get the perfect shot. Um, but then like at the end of the movie, it, it twists completely on its head and you learn that he is talking to who a man named Virgil and Virgil, who he nicknamed Verge, isn't, um, I don't know how to explain this other than just saying it. We're basically going through Dante's, um, Inferno. We're going through the yeah. the rings of hell. Yeah, Virgil, the levels of hell. The levels of hell. We're, we're talking to Virgil, and and it's a very interesting because um because what what is it that they call Dante's Inferno? It's it's a it's not a do they call they don't call it a comedy do they? What do they call it? Uh, yeah, I mean it, yeah, it's comedy, but it's not not like what we think of a comedy. It's not it, what we think of a comedy. Yeah, it's a it has a different meaning, and when you talk in, in, in epic poems and things like that. Right. A, yeah. So so basically we're we're and it's like it has these weird like parallels to the different levels because basically as we go along to these different areas, um, I mean basically Vir- Virgil is taking him through the levels of hell, the different layers, and you know Jack is talking about the the various things that he's done and it, it's very interesting because when he started saying Verge and I'm like who is he talking to. And like you said, I was thinking to myself, it's got to be like a psychiatrist or like a, I honestly thought it was going to be like um, like a like a clergyman, like at a, like a like a priest or something. Yeah. But then it turns out to literally be like super supernatural, like he's going to hell now. And it, it's weird. And, and I, I didn't totally understand it at the time. But a lot of people theorize that when he built the house that he committed suicide, that Jack committed suicide and we just didn't see it. And that that's why he's going to hell now, because he committed an unforgivable sin beyond obviously killing a bunch of people. Uh, (laughs) But obviously this is a, you know, Dante's uh, comedy, Dante's Inferno um, is sort of a um, sort of a a, a spoof of, you know, Catholicism. So it it wouldn't surprise me totally if they were going that route. But yeah, it. Honestly, I really liked the movie. I do. I really, really liked it, and and it has all these really weird like ties in to like sort of like that dramatic comedy thing and everything else. And it's just it, it's so odd, such an odd movie, but a very good yeah. movie. <laughs> yeah, it it was. Um, you know, and it's you almost get to the point where you you watch a movie expecting something to happen, right? Some a twist to it or something to be revealed. And, and and I was in this one, right? I was I was trying to you know to watch, seeing where they were going with this, right? And and I and I got to one point where I thought, so maybe this Verge guy uh, has caught him, but it, it, it's he's not like law enforcement. Maybe he's another killer, right? And he's he's yeah. got I don't know, maybe they'll do something like that. I don't know, you know. It's like what are they doing here? Never thought this, right? And and this was it was a pretty wild twist. Uh, it was a you know, kind of caught, I mean, caught me off guard, 
You know, I mean, it was it was weird, um, but it was a well done movie. Matt Dillon was it was great in it. Uh, you know, it was a like I said, it was it had some very disturbing stuff in it, but it had to, right? It had to, it had to have elements of that to show just because it was trying to pretty much paint this guy as just just evil, right? Just a just yeah. a an emotionless uh, evil man, right? Who uh, and it, it, so it was it was it was good. It was a good movie. It was it was long. I will. I mean, I'll be like. Lord, it was like two and a half hours. I was like, oh, maybe I just picked it just to kill me for the length um, <laughs> because I, I tend to not. But it, but it was not, you know, it was a, uh, you know, it didn't it didn't drag uh, at any point. So. But it uh, it was good. Again, it was one of those movies where you when you watch it and even if you're trying to figure out where it's going, if you know, you chances are better not you're not going to you're not going to think this. It's, no. it's not what you're going to come up with. And uh, so it's pretty wild because it seems so, so rooted through the whole movie. Right. And, and this, you know, like it, everything was possible and, and, and everything. And then it took that that twist and it suddenly went like 180 where, oh, you know, we flipped the script here. And it's this is no longer like this reality type, you know, approach or whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're now talking about hell and, and, and traveling down through hell. And, and and I think what ultimately he. When he tries to get to the staircase that can get him out of hell, and he he falls, I think into into the uh, whatever the the fiery abyss or whatever at the end of the movie. But uh, I think so. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So it was a good movie. Uh. I, you know, I enjoyed it. It was. I think it definitely fit in with our our disturbing theme of the episode. Absolutely. Uh, it, it had it had some disturbing some disturbing topics. So uh, before we jump into the other movie, let's uh, let's write this one real quick. Uh, again. You know, I said, like I said, I enjoyed it. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a masterful masterpiece type movie, but it was very, very well done. Uh, so I think I would give it probably a three and a half screams out of five. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to disagree with you slightly. I, I really enjoyed this movie. Um, it, it was one of those movies that I watched um, going into it because everybody told me it was really disturbing. And I was like, OK, this is probably going to be one of those shock fest movies. Um, that people are just saying is a shocking movie, so people watch them, and it's going to be shocking for no value. Um, but this movie had, I would say, a lot of a, a weird amount of return on it, and it had a very interesting message about, you know, the dogma of man, the 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 yeah. the, the downfall of of a killer. You know, how does a killer approach his destiny when he's going to hell? You know what I mean? And that's kind of yeah. how it's about. It's about him talking about his path and. I, I really enjoyed it, so I'm going to give it a four. I'm going to give it a four screams out of five. I would say that this is on par with how I felt about Skinamarink, I would say. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, then, uh, Ike, move us on to our other movie, and let's discuss Infinity Pool. Absolutely. So, first things first, I'm just going to say what the fuck, because that's exactly how I felt about this movie, but Infinity Pool hey, 2023. Man. Oh, my God. It is available for purchase on most digital platforms. It is starring the wonderful Mia Goth and the most handsome Skarsgård, Alexander Skarsgård, in my opinion. Um, James and M. Foster are enjoying an all-inclusive beach vacation in the fictional island of um, Lotoka. And when a fatal accident exposes the resort's perverse subculture of hedonistic tourism, reckless violence, and surreal horrors, this movie was originally rated NC-17 for some graphic violence and sexual content. And then after an unsuccessful appeal for an R, Neon edited the film to get the desired rating. The uncut version version was screened at Sundance while the edited version was released in theaters. A little Freudian slip there for you. There you me. go. Um, I was going to say before – you read that all the way through. I thought, how the hell did this have an NC-17 rating? But yeah, clearly then it was edited. Cause I'm like this, <laughs> I, I don't see that that much of the, you know, the excessive graphic violence or sexual contact, but I, I, I get now that it was edited. So. Right. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say, I, I could definitely see where this could have had an NC-17 rating had it not been edited. <laughs> yeah. um, but, boy, uh, oh, boy. Go ahead. I was going to say, I'll, I'll start on this one. I'll start on infinity okay. pool and then you can kind of pick up there. So, who boy um so let me let me preface this by dave and i's conversation when we were talking about what movies to film or to talk about <laughs> yeah um 
So we talked about um, what, you know, because we're like, okay, well, we can't review Winnie, Winnie the Pooh kills people in the woods because nobody was showing it. So we're like, what movies are we going to watch? And I was like, this is a perfect opportunity to talk about Jet, House of Jack Bill. And I was like super excited. Um, and I'm so glad we got to talk about it because I love that movie. But then Dave's like, oh, hey, by the way, Infinity Pool come out. Do you want to do that one too? And I'm like, hell yeah, I wanted to watch that movie. I never got to see it in theaters. And he's like, yeah, it's supposed to be the most messed up movie of 2023. And boy, oh boy, were you not kidding. Um, let's see. If I had to summarize this this show, this movie into one word, it would be trippy. Because – so like the movie basically centers around this island has a, a replicator where they just duplicate you as a human being. So if you commit a crime, if you have enough money, you can choose to be cloned. And yes. your clone is cloned with all of your memories – it knows that it's guilty of the crime that you committed, and then that clone is then murdered. It's killed for your crimes. Yes. And the it, it, so I mean, obviously, this opens up a very important dialogue of, um, and they even talk about it in the movie um, when they clone you. How do you know that was the clone? How do you know you're not the clone? You know what I mean? Yes. Correct. And so, who's the clone? Who's not the clone? And they really play up on that. Because kind of the point of the movie is that um, Alexander Skarsgård is essentially just being tortured for fun, right? He's yeah. being drugged. He's being, you know, they're they're like intoxicating him. They're forcing him to like beat the shit out of himself, literally, um, like a clone of himself. And like it's like this really trippy, like, like I, it, honestly, the only thing that I could think that this movie was trying to accomplish is potentially why cloning people isn't a good idea. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I don't know, man, but it, it has so many, so much in terms of like trippy elements and storytelling and the visuals were really trippy. And what I mean by that is like, they literally did drugs. And so they tried to like give you like the drug induced like moment. And it very much, very much felt like that. I, I felt woozy after some of those parts in those movies were like, they're tripping balls and, um, they're they're suckling at the teat of whatever that thing was. And, <laughs> oh my god! Like literally. So me, me and my wife watched this together, and my wife's only words to me after that movie was finished was "What the fuck?" <laughs> like those are the I, only yeah. words she said. <laughs> but you go ahead, Dave. You give me your thoughts. Uh, on well, woo. And I, I I understand why people are saying it's disturbing. It's 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 odd. It's weird. It's whatever. I, I get all that. Um, I, I feel like there's a lot of commentary here. Maybe maybe it's just me. A lot of commentary here on the rich yep. and how sometimes money can get you out of situations and how that power just breeds more problems, right? Because these people had all clearly done bad things on this island and bought their way out of it, and now it was almost a game, right? They were coming back to do more because they knew they could buy their way out, and they were tricking other people into it. And uh, using their money and their power in, in a bad way here, and um, man, it was it was weird. It was I, I don't even know. Um, I don't even know. It was going for a while, and it's like it was just <laughs> it was. Wow, I don't even know. I don't even know how to wrap my brain around a lot of this because he he clearly was conflicting about this, right? He was he was being manipulated in some ways, but yet he was enjoying it in others, it seemed like. Because he didn't make too much of an effort to leave, right? He hid his own passport at yeah. the one part so he didn't have to leave and uh, sent his, whatever, his girlfriend or his wife or whatever away. Um, but it was, I don't, I don't even know. It's so hard for me to wrap, to, to, to formulate thoughts on this because... The movie was a little all over all over the place. That's an understatement. And, uh, I don't know. And it's – God, I don't even know. I mean I don't even know what to say about this movie. It was – it. I, to be frank, it wasn't my favorite. No. Because it was, it was just – what we spoke of earlier, it, it felt like it was trying to, at points to be shocking just for the shock. 
right? To be weird and be different. And and not really telling a, a story. It was – these people had no no concern with what they were doing. They were enjoying it. It was just entertaining to them. And then at the end when they were leaving, it was just like they could just flip it off. They were going back to life, and, oh, that's okay. It was just – it was vacation. And um, But he didn't. He went back, right? He He skipped out from his flight or whatever and so i don't i don't know i don't know what what is i don't know what that's supposed to mean <laughs> with yeah. uh about him because i don't know was he a pawn or was he a, an addict of this was he addicted to, to the feeling and the and the power too uh was that just his part of the process where he was he was becoming uh you know hungry with with what he could do and what he could get away with um i don't know i don't know quite where they were going with it and um and what what was i don't know i don't know what it was meant to be, meant to be so it's like i don't know what to say um yeah. you know the, I, he you know was tricked in the one scene to what he thought was beating up the the officer that caught him or whatever and it turned out to be a clone of himself and and then that led to a weird ass you know fetal breast Feeding scene with him and the Mia Goth character after it was over, after he killed the clone, or it was weird. And uh, so and I don't know. I don't know if it was good weird. I, I just don't feel that it was a, a good weird. So I I think I know what the movie's about. Um, I think. So let me preface this by saying that like 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 Dave said, I didn't hate the movie, but I didn't overtly love it. The David Cronenberg, who made this movie, or sorry, Brandon Cronenberg, um, he's kind of known for just making weird movies. Um, I haven't seen any of those other movies, but I have heard of them. So here's what I think this movie is about. I think this movie is about a concept called ego death. So ego death is 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 basically when you have a complete loss of. Um, of, of self identity. Basically, yeah. you, you don't you don't really you kind of your 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 pers your 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 personal identity basically is killed and and it's done in a lot of different ways. It's done in a lot of different contexts, but basically it, it is essentially a complete fundamental transformation of your psyche. And I think genuinely that's what this movie is about. I think that's what it's trying to approach because the entirety of this movie it, it's premised around alexander skarsgård's character killing himself basically like bringing himself to kill himself because that's the point they wanted him to kill the officer which they was actually himself in a bagged head they wanted him to kill him um and then at the end of the movie they they had a um a, 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 his clone like on a leash and yeah they wanted him to kill that clone and so I think this movie, the entire purpose and concept of this movie is ego death. The death of yourself, the death of your, 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 I guess your, your self identity. And that's what happens. Alexander Skarsgård's character goes through this transformation because of all that he had gone through. He went through the psychological, you know, changes, the physical act of dying. He killed himself. So he himself has died in front of himself you know what i mean yeah. and so you know ego death is kind of an interesting you know concept in general but i think that th that was what this movie was trying to approach is trying to approach that sort of psychological transformation that he goes through and I, I, a lot of times when you go through this in theory if you were to go through this you you find yourself being lost right H how do you go back to living a normal life when you have when you die when when you when your ego dies when your identity dies, how can you go back to living a normal life? You know what I mean? So I think that's yeah. what it's trying to approach is that how can this character go back to living normal life when he has completely uh, essentially transcended in a way um, from that kind of self-identity. So that's what I think the movie's about. Yeah. I, I mean, it completely wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, he was, he was clearly unhappy with, with his life, right? He had written yeah. a book that didn't, wasn't as successful as he had wanted. Um, he was having trouble trying to come up, you know, write a follow up or, or do anything further with his writing. Um, so, you know, yeah, he was already he was already having struggles. Uh, clearly him and his 
like I said, his I don't know if it's his wife or his girlfriend or whatever. They it was a weird kind of a tense relationship, right? They didn't feel very close. Right. Um, there was, you know, I, I don't think she was very supportive of him as a writer. Um, so it was, I just, I, I feel like, you know, he was already pretty unhappy with who he was and where he was alive. So, uh, I don't know. Again, it was, I don't know, maybe it's me being sick. Maybe it's me being overly medicated. It's just, <laughs> it's very hard for me to formulate thoughts and, and words on this movie. Um, I, because it was just, it felt very all over the place to me. And, um, and again, not, not a good weird for me. It just, I, I didn't really find it as enjoyable as I'd hoped, right? Where the, the concept of it and who was in it, I really had a lot of expectations for this movie. And it just, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't click for me. And, um, you know, I know, I know it's, you know, some people, it is, it is clicking for them and they are enjoying it. I, I, I've i seen online people talking about it, but, you know, whether it's just not the type of movie for me, whether, again, it's my current state uh, that's impending this, it, it just didn't, it didn't hit for me. Um, but, uh, you know, and it makes me, makes me all the more disappointed that I didn't get to see Winnie the Pooh killing people. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so, so let's write this one. Again, I, I, I hate to be harsh. But again, I, I just I did not enjoy the movie. It did not hit on me. I, I'm frankly, I'm going to give it a two screams out of five because I just really did not enjoy the movie. And I felt like it was really severely lacking uh, in, in kind of uh, the, the storytelling development. Absolutely. Um, so I won't go as far as a two. I will probably give it a two point five. And the reason I say a two point five is that it's like when you look at the the just the overall if you look at the overall of this movie it was a good movie it did not have very good pacing it had a lot of interesting concepts it had a great cast it was very well casted and very well acted it was just i felt like there was a lot of context that was missing and i feel like it could have been better maybe if it wasn't because we even talked about last time you know non-linear storytelling Nonlinear storytelling can work very well if you know what you're doing, but in some cases like this, it, it it's not your typical straightforward linear storytelling, and it just didn't work. So, yeah, two point five out of five for me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, again, it, yeah, like I said, it did did not click with me. Um, and again, I was I, maybe it's because maybe I hyped it a little in my head because of of who was it. Again, they were great. They were they were very talented in the movie, but just they you know they didn't save the movie for me. Yeah. And uh, so I was disappointed. So uh, but, you know, I'm looking forward to next week. I'm looking forward to a little cheese, a little fun, a little <laughs> violence, uh, just just something where I don't have to try to formulate thought in my sixth state. And I could just watch a bear high on cocaine uh, killing people. Um, sounds good to me. Again, next week we'll be reviewing cocaine bear. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. So I before we close the door on this one and get out of here, anything you wanna anything you wanna add? Well, um, all I can say is that th- this has been a, a traumatic week of watching movies for me. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, absolutely. I, I just want to say um, no no hard feelings with uh, with Brandon Cronenberg. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll watch your next movie, man. But uh, yeah, this, this one wasn't for me, man. Yeah. Obviously, yeah, we, he's not listening. He didn't give a shit, but <laughs> <laughs> probably not. But you never know, I guess. But uh, uh, so, yeah, we, we've talked a lot of disturbing movies. I feel like next week we're going to have a palate cleanser and just go for some uh, <laughs> non thinking graphic gore uh, with a, a bear high on cocaine. So that, that might be a good thing for us to to get a mental reset here and uh, not have to overthink the, 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 the topic too much. But until next week, make sure you subscribe to us and follow us on social media. Uh, and again, go watch the movies. Uh, maybe you'll maybe you'll love them. Just because we didn't doesn't mean you won't. Uh, but if you want to prepare for next week, go see Cocaine Bear in theater. Support this movie. Um, as as we like to say, support all the movies. Support all the horror movies. Let's, let's support horror as a genre. And until next week, wherever you go and whatever you do, be good, be safe, and have many pleasant nightmares. <laughs>